Listen to this. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This isn't just for Christ to be the resident in your heart. This is for him to be the president in your heart. Is Christ, uh, is he at home in your heart? You ever gone somewhere, stayed with somebody and just didn't feel at home? Even if they said, make yourself at home. Just, it's, it's hard to do that. It's not your home. But there are a few places, I bet all of us know where they are. If you, there's some places you could go, and you know where everything is. Right? Because, because you're acquainted, you're intimately acquainted with that home. You know, Jesus is in the heart of all believers, but I'm pretty sure he's not, uh, not happy with some of the things he, the places we take him. And I'm sure he's not happy with some of the thoughts that come through our mind. He's there. He's in our mind. He's in our heart. He goes everywhere we go. He reads everything we read. He sees everything we see. I'll tell you a quick Zebedee story. Put my neighbor on, on, the, on the TV today. I have to give him a tape. John and Tracy Pope, our neighbors, and, and Garrett's one of their, little, their sons, and uh, Zebby and here buddies. And I was over at John's place getting Zeb, and they were talking, and, and, uh, and I think John said to Garrett, Hey, Garrett, where's that $2 that I gave you the other day? And Zebby said, We were in John Pope's kitchen, not in my house, his house, and Zebby said, It's over in the money drawer. And John said, it is. He said, yeah. And he went over, Zebby went over to their kitchen in their drawer, pulled out the money drawer, picked it up, said, see, it's right here. Here's that money. And Mr. Pope says, Zeb, I didn't even know we had a money drawer. <laughs> Zebby was at home in the Pope house. Very comfortable there. Mr. Pope needs to ask Zeb where things are. That's a true story. Lord, would you, would you be at home in my heart? Could, could we start praying that? Lord, are you at home in my heart? Do you feel welcomed? Are we on the same page? Are you comfortable in my heart, Lord? Because I want to grow deeper. I want to be more grounded in love. Do you know why we're not rooted and grounded deeper in our love? Because we're inconsistent in our faith. We believe sometimes, sometimes we don't. We love sometimes, sometimes we don't. Our solid foundation that we want and pray for is honestly oftentimes a shaky foundation. And the reason is this, because Christians live in two worlds. That's why this prayer is so important. We live in two worlds. We live in God's world, and we live in our world. We live for spiritual things, and we live for physical things. We live for God's glory, and we live for our security. And we've got to get on one foundation. We've got to have one thought, one heart, one desire. Realize that there's nothing in life that isn't spiritual. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.31, uh, Whatever you do, whether in eating and drinking, do it all to the glory of God. Even in the most mundane things, do it for God's glory. Even in your eating and drinking. How about on your drive to work? Pump some of God's stuff into your mind through the radio. You're going, to, you're going against the flow and the tide. You, we've got to find a way to be stronger here. It's interesting to me. There are two words, two phrases in the Bible that ought to scare us. One is the word double-minded, and the other one is double-tongued. Does that not scare you, especially that second one? You know what a double-minded person is? A person whose mind is to live for Christ one minute and mind to live for themselves the next. And so they just go back and forth during the week. And what, sometimes we call these folks Sunday Christians. On, on Sunday, they're at church, that's their mindset, but the rest of the week, it doesn't seem like that's their mindset. Double-minded. A double-tongued person will say one thing to a believer when they're talking to a Christian, but their language will change when they're talking to an unbeliever. Or, let me put it in a Christian context on how churches can get divided and uh, con conflict. I've seen this happen where we were in a, a, not here, but in a deacon's meeting and making some serious decisions and had to come out with, with, with we didn't want to come out until we were united. It took us about six weeks and we came out and we said, if you can't be united, we, then, then, and the, there were a couple guys that just didn't think we were making the right decision and we said that you guys need to come next week and pre present your case. Give us your biblical, we want to hear from you men. And it was, it was beautiful the way it worked out. 
They gave their case. We all talked. We end, end up coming to a, an agreement somehow. But there were a couple guys when that was over. And what we said is, if you can't leave here united, then we got to keep praying and keep meeting. Nope, we're all united. We're all together. Same page. What happened in the weeks to come? A couple of those guys went to people. People said, I can't believe you guys made that decision. A fella said, I can't believe they did it either. Either. So you were in there. They said they were united. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was in there. I was united. I just felt a lot of pressure. That happens more times than you think. Where people come out, say one thing in one company, they come out and say another thing. These were the deacons. These are supposed to be the most spiritual ones in the church. I don't know about you, but the more I think about this, the more I realize I need to pray this. His first prayer in chapter 1 was awesome, and I think this one is equally as awesome. Praying for spiritual might, praying for spiritual love, also praying for spiritual knowledge. That we may be able to comprehend. God, help us to understand with all the saints together. Help us to understand the length, depth, height to know. It's one thought. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled. That's the ultimate finality. He ends with a doxology, but here's where he's ending. The end result of praying for might, love, and knowledge is that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. Like leaving a buffet restaurant. I hate buffet restaurants. You say, why do you go to them? Because it's buffet. <laughs> and when I was 27, I left there feeling like I just took advantage of that business. I got my money's worth. But at 47, and my metabolism is about 67, it seems like, I leave the buffet restaurant with regret <laughs> and remorse. Who knows what I'm talking about? Because no matter what, I, when I get feel, filled, I start wondering if I should eat more. You know what it's like to be filled with food. You know what it's like to be filled with joy. Right? Life has a way, and, and even this crazy world, life fills us with joy. I mean, I was, I, was, I was filled with joy this weekend a couple times. One of, the, one of the best ways to fill yourself with joy is to go visit Christians. You want to be filled with joy? Go see some of our homebound people who would give anything to be in church. But they can't drive. They, they can't see well enough. I'm going to do this pretty soon, but we've got to... I'm going to start asking you and have you sign up to go pick somebody up who wants to be here but can't get here. We need to have an army of people that will pick people up because they want to be... You know what? We need them. We need them. We, we need those big smiling faces. We need those, those people that, that are so in love. We need them. We need them so bad. See all the gaps in these pews? We need to put them there. And they will lift us up. And we're lifted up today, but I mean, they'll lift us up even higher. They, they've lost the privilege of the church assembled, and so it means so much to them. Filled. Filled. With all the fullness of God. Lord, I mean, I gotta, we got to pray this. Lord, fill us up with all the fullness of God. This is the end result. That's what God's looking for. I am so full. I think I said this Wednesday. A couple of you smiled at me when I said this. But here's what I said. Hey, let's fill our lives with God and then let's go bump into people. Let's fill our lives with God like you'd fill a bucket of water and let's just bump into people. Let's spill out on people what we're full of. By the way, you are spilling something on the people that you come in contact with. And you, you, you alone know what's in that bucket. Have you ever spilled something on somebody? You didn't like what came out of you? I have. Ooh, that was not good, I thought. I didn't say it right. I wish I could have that word back. Bad attitude, short answer. We're, we're spilling something on somebody. 
every time we come in contact with them. And the goal in life, the goal in life is to, every time you see a believer, spill encouragement on them. How you doing, brother? And don't, don't go, how you doing, and move. Stop, how are you doing? And speak the truth in love. Encourage them. I haven't seen you. Are you doing okay? And every time you see an unbeliever, spill the love of Christ on them. Jesus did that. Can you imagine hanging on a cross? I'm very concerned about unforgiveness. Very concerned. I hear it all the time. I grew up with it. I held on to unforgiveness and bitterness. I'm probably an expert in fear, insecurity, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger. I'm really good at those. I lived, I, I fed those things for 22 years. I know what life is like with that. And Christian people, 